Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Precision Medicine, Chat GPT, and AI, History and, Twi and Trends. I'm Greg Berry, Director of Communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since this is a virtual event, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. If you have problems with your video or audio, click the reconnect button on your screen to get back to the webinar right away. As we begin, I'd like to know how familiar you are with today's topic. We'll have a poll that we can toss up there. With this poll, let me go ahead, and there you see it. We just wanna know where you are. Are you a rookie and you know nothing about it? Do you know a little bit more, but you want more? Uh, maybe you just know enough to make you dangerous in conversations, or perhaps your knowledge is vast and you're just wanting to learn about the latest and greatest, or maybe even yet, just maybe, you're such a pro that you're using AI to select your answers and register for all of our events. We'll keep that poll up for a few minutes as we go ahead and submit that. Today's webinar is being recorded. A replay will be uploaded onto our website by tomorrow. Also, if you have a question for today's guest, drop it in the chat. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. And as I look over at the poll, most of you know a little bit about AI and ChatGPT, all of this technology, but want to know more. And one of you, 1% of you, they, you know what? AI selected this for you. Today, we are extremely excited to welcome Dr. Jake Chin. Dr. Chin is the Chief Bioinformatics Officer at the UAB Informatics Institute and a professor of genetic computer science and biomedical engineering earned his Master of Science and Doctorate in Computer Science and Engineering from the University of Minnesota. At this time, I would like to formally welcome Dr. Chin to our webinar series. Dr. Chin, it's great to have you and the platform is yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Greg. And uh, wow. even though I don't get to see all of you from the other side of the computer screen, wow. but uh, I'm pretty sure you're uh, very excited, uh, not because of me, but because of the topic that I'm uh, going to talk about today. As you can see, it spans a huge range of topics uh, that are all uh, buzzwords of today. And given that the UAB is a medical uh, institu uh, research institution, we have lots of interest ourselves as a researcher how to use uh, this increasingly powerful machine learning, artificial intelligence for doing everyday research, biomedical sciences, and also translate those research into clinical practice. So today I'm gonna actually go from 10,000 miles to very much of a, a, a details of exactly what we're doing. And I have more content than probably possibly fit within the one hour format. So I might actually ask Greg uh, to uh, help me skip the slides and um, from time to time. All right. So uh, I think uh, the chat GPT really caught the general public by surprise because it's tremendous language skills, right? Here I'm showing a Chinese poem that I grew up uh, to learn. It's Bai Ri Yi Shan Jin, Huang He Ru Hai Liu. It's a very inspirational Chinese poem that is actually showed, uh, illustrated as this picture. A poet look at the sunset and try to climb up uh, one more stair to look farther beyond uh, into the horizon. And he know that only by climbing up higher and higher uh, will he see uh, farther into the distance. And there's a translation uh, done by ChatGPT. It wasn't even uh, GPT-4, it was the GPT-3.5 that says, a uh, hundred days to admire the mountains uh, end, the yellow river flows into the seas without bend. To see a thousand miles ascend once more and climb to the top of another floor. And it's perfect. I wouldn't be able to write an English poem like this, even though I've been here in the United, United States for almost 30 years, right? So it, it really have achieved a great intelligence over the years to the point that even Bill Gates in his personal blog have written a blog that says the age of AI has begun. Well, what you, uh, many of you 
probably did not know, Bill Gates was uh, sitting behind the open AI boardroom many times. And he was very doubtful until the last moment when ChatGPT 3.5 was alive. And he thought it was just a gimmick, a toy, and may take us maybe five or 10 years to get there. But when he actually sees the true ChatGPT, he was taken back and written this blog. And there's a, a particular example I want to show. I don't know if I uh, am able to play this. Low-dose computed tomography, or LDCT, is an imaging technique widely used to screen for lung cancer. Lung cancer screening recommendations currently revolve mainly around a patient's age and smoking history, based on inclusion criteria of pivotal clinical trials. This approach is not optimal, considering the recent increase in lung cancer diagnoses among those with a history of never or light smoking. To this end, a team of researchers from the Jamil Clinic at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Massachusetts General Hospital developed a deep learning algorithm that can predict individual lung cancer risk without clinical or demographic data inputs. The algorithm, named Sybil, uses data from a single LDCT scan to predict the likelihood of the development of lung cancer one to six years in the future. Sybil was trained using over 28,000 scans with known lung cancer risk and was programmed to learn from expert annotations of biopsy-confirmed cancers to better reason over the entire LDCT. The team evaluated the performance of Sybil using three independent data sets of LDCT scans of diverse patient cohorts from the National Lung Screening Trial, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. They found that Sybil could forecast short and long-term lung cancer risk from the LDCT scans accurately for a wide range of patients and on modern scanners. Moreover, it provided relevant information regarding future lung cancer risk in patients. Sybil has the potential to revolutionize lung cancer screening and management, enhance personalized screening, and reduce the overall frequency of biopsies. Combined, these applications can increase cost-effectiveness and may make LDCT-based lung cancer screening feasible even in low-resource settings. Importantly, the preliminary data indicate that Sybil may be a powerful tool for prioritizing patients who are at higher risk of lung cancer, regardless of their smoking history. Further research is warranted to enable Sybil for real-world clinical applications. All right. Yeah. So this is a short video clip from... Uh, the uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology. And I wanted to show you this example just so that you understand that artificial intelligence has already making its footprint in medicine. Um, that was a great example how uh, artificial intelligence can benefit uh, clinical care. But what exactly is our artificial intelligence? Right, so. I'm a computer scientist. I know that artificial intelligence, and when we uh, study uh, computer science uh, about 20 some years ago, uh, it was mostly about the aspiration of using computers to emulate uh, human intelligence. And maybe we won't be able to get there, but the aspiration is that the human uh, can perceive with the eyes and uh, can synthesize speeches and make decisions. Can we make computer to behave like human? And for many, many years, and that was an exploration and that involved a lot of the under the radar research by computer scientists. Uh, in fact, if you look back in history, uh, John McCarthy uh, from uh, MIT, coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956. It was in the Dartmouth uh, conference and many of the participants uh, with a picture shown here 
or the founding fathers that uh, created different flavors of artificial intelligence. Uh, since its birth, artificial intelligence have gone through uh, periods of hypes and a meltdown. And uh, when there's a hype, initially, uh, the Department of Defense are thinking that, oh, if, if we can create artificial intelligence, maybe we can make the computer to reason like human. But it turned out that computers back then uh, that was great at calculating uh, trajectories for rockets, but it has only a very tiny bit of a CPU, right? And uh, the computer wasn't powerful enough. So you had to condense all of the human knowledge into rules and very simple representation of the human knowledges. Um, and then it didn't really uh, go very far in terms of accuracy and performance. And there's new hypes when we have expert system, computer become powerful, and there's a personal computer system, but then for a variety of reasons, they didn't deliver until what we call the third wave of AI, which is today. Now, um, I did mention about the three waves, and I, I want you to remember that in the first wave is rule-based, and the rule base meaning that if you say, well, today is cloudy and in cloudy weather, we feel more comfortable outside. And then you can say today, I feel more comfortable outside. Right? So that's rules. But what if sometimes uh, I still feel it's very soggy outside and I, what do I feel? Do I feel comfortable or uncomfortable? And the rule based system cannot really resolve these potential conflict. And there's a statistical machine learning, and I'll talk about it uh, slightly later, that essentially look at all of the data instead of rules, try to make decisions and models. But it turned out that the computers are quite limited. Whatever data you feed it into, it will try to learn. Sometimes it learn too well that it only work in that particular data set. So uh, the difference between computers and humans are in our ability to perceive con context. For example, I say, I feel comfortable today is because of many, many contexts. I'm sitting in my patio and this breeze going through and it's just rained many early in the morning and I'm making a, a lot of fun, <laughs> uh, having a lot of fun just um, doing this presentation. So all of that is a contextual information that says, okay, I'm feeling pretty comfortable today. And can the computer actually make decisions in the contextual situation? That is the problem, uh, that is the, what the third wave of AI is trying to solve, right? So there's a lot of terminologies and I want you to know that artificial intelligence is a generic term. Machine learning is to teach machine uh, how to learn and build models, and that's a more uh, specialized terminology. And deep learning is what is unique in the third wave of AI, uh, essentially using lots and lots of neural networks, and I'm going to talk to you uh, uh, next. So in the first wave, for example, one of the person that I actually still network with uh, came up with expert systems in biology and medicine, right? Uh, he was a, a chair of Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia before he retired. Uh, his name is uh, Ted Shortlip. So in this system, uh, it's really uh, emphasizing computer's ability to do reasoning. Say, if you have rules, if A then B, if B then C, you can actually give the system some data A, and then it can automatically reach a con conclusion C. Right? I just give you the example of the weather and the comfort level as uh, example of using these rule system. It turned out that you can implement a system like this that have a user interaction part and the inference engine, a knowledge base of all these rules. Uh, in fact, if you go back 20 years, uh, a lot of the clinical informatics uh, in hospitals are 
hard coding these rules and say, if you had these symptoms, and then maybe you will have this particular dis disorder called lump lupus. And then if you had these other symptoms, and maybe you will have fever uh, or uh, skin inflammation. And so the computers are able to do some inferencing, but uh, the accuracy is now very high. In the second wave, we get rid of the, the rules and we're saying, can we learn the rules automatically from the data? For example, there are uh, these uh, dots that are forming two classes and you have to actually draw a curved line to separate them in the two dimensional space. That's called a classification, right? So if we wanna classify it uh, and then in this uh, 2D space, you have two attributes, uh, X and Y, right? Maybe one is the weather, the other is um, the location. And then you try to uh, predict that the people are feeling comfortable or not comfortable today. Um, the most common approach is to convert it into a linear kernel, which is a line that's a linear line with some buffer. And then you try to do the classification. There are many, many techniques I won't talk about exactly how they achieve this, but essentially it's all data and then it's all labels. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, if you can actually learn from these data, a set of rules that uh, that looks like the rules in the expert system, the computer really achieved the mastery of the classification subject. For example, you can say survival of passenger on the Titanic. If you learn from the data and then you can come up with this rule-based system called the decision trees. If it's gender is male, uh, age uh, is uh, actually, yeah, certain ages and the whether you have sibling or not. And then it will say that, okay, the passenger will tend to uh, die on the ship or not. Okay. So um, as you can see that there are actually two completely different approaches. One is to use a language model concept and try to do classification. For example, in this particular example, you have Apple and you're saying, how do I use the languages? Uh, and then reason, uh, what is an apple? You can say, where is coming from? If it's coming from an apple tree is an apple, right? What is the structure? And we all know what apple look like. And uh, what is uh, the label from maybe the grocery store? And then from this, you can, finally conclude that this is an apple. So this is what we call the symbolic approach using human languages. And then there's a the statistical approach, essentially you just say, I don't know what apple is. Let's just measure all the data about uh, apple and use these internal representation that may or may not be comprehended by humans. They're variables. And then we'll just compute and eventually there's the answer, yes or no. Right, so these two approaches uh, for many years and they do not work well very much. And the expert system is more on the symbolic approach. Statistical machine learning is more on the uh, uh, connectionist approach. And they all have weaknesses and uh, uh, just uh, advantages. And people are starting to think, well, well, what if that we have a perfect system and we can do statistical inference and we can also use a human language symbols and wouldn't be uh, nice. So that was a dream uh, until you come to the third wave of AI. And the third wave of AI, uh, essentially what is increasingly emphasized is to it be able to use all of the contextual information. And that contextual information can be tens of thousands of variables. Now think about a patient walking into a clinic, right? The doctor cannot just rely on the patient description of himself because the description of himself, he may say, well, I feel pain today. Uh, I felt that I have something up in my nose and I have fever. These three attributes, that's far from enough to make a di diagnosis. 
But the contextual information really means to take everything that can be measured, and that could be tens of thousands or even millions of variables to build into the model and make decisions, right? So this is one example. Uh, we call it feature engineering because essentially we come up with uh, hundreds of thousands of features from these images. So there's a nice lady and there are some objects on the table. So that's the data coming in. And the computer do not actually see just images as pixels. We can train our computers to recognize, in this case, the silhouette of the lady. And uh, those are actually represented in the computer matrix format. And then in this particular case, uh, object, we can identify the object, eliminate all the details, and just say this is the shape of the object. Um, and it turned out that these are all considered to be features. Now, what is so special about deep learning is that with many, many internal representation as nodes, we can represent uh, not just one, not 10, not 100, not 10,000, we can potentially represent millions of features like this in a long chain, what we call the, the deep learning model. And when we have lots and lots of features and these features, some of these features will be important in saying this is a nice lady and some of these are actually object. And therefore um, we can actually pull these features and then in the end use these features to make a decision. And so these uh, feature engineering uh, can be done automatically without human intervention. And sometimes and there's an explosion of features and therefore we don't even understand how the computer were making the decisions. Just like in our brain, we have a hundred uh, billion brain cells and then we don't understand how we were able to speak a uh, perfect language. Um, Maybe mine is not perfect, but uh, some people are. Um, but then uh, there are lots of connections that are happening in between. Uh, we don't really understand, but we, we understand that it's highly accurate once the model is built. Um, and then how does it work? So underlying these uh, feature engineering nodes is this a little artificial representation of neurons. Um, so uh, each neuron uh, can do very, very simple tasks, right? So you have a bunch of variables and then each of the variable will contribute some weight significance, we call it weight. And then we build a function and it's called a sigmoid function. The sigmoid function and the very low level of values, it remains almost like a zero level. And once you reach above a threshold, and then you can actually get closer and closer to one. So it's a, it has a very nice property and then we use this a sigmoid function to output the variable. Uh, and then this uh, sigma essentially will say, with all of these input, have I made a decision that this is either zero or one case? Right, so it's awful a simple representation and the scientists have already figured out a way to use a bunch of these neurons to represent the data and the truth about the data that uh, essentially the decision you want to make. So for example, if your actual answer is like these two dots and there are some, some um, decisions about the patient is having cancer, not having cancer. The system will learn from these instances and then will go through these neurons and getting activated with different ways will generate some output. Initially, it probably it's completely bogus answers, wrong. And what we can do is to train the system to go back and adjust the weight systematically so that when you adjust it, you can evaluate how close your adjusted output is to the actual answer. And then we can optimize the system to the point that with 
iteration after iterations, we can build a perfect weighting system such that the output is almost close or 100% or maybe very close to 100% to the actual answer. Um, we weren't able to do that when the neurons, layers of neurons are less, but we are able to build perfectly if we have more and more internal features as, as neuron. So that turned out to be a perfect, general, it seems to be a perfect machinery. It's like we're building our artificial brain using computers. So this is an example from Google Deep Learning Pipeline. Anyone who have any kind of a data, uh, if you have a massive computer computing framework, and at UAB we have uh, Chia Ha, and uh, I also help build uh, within the Informatic Institute a system called the Ubright that is essentially using all of the supercomputer. Uh, we can input the data, and user can write Python program, interact with the, uh, the data, and build these uh, deep learning framework. And these deep learning framework. Of course, the most popular ones are on the Amazon or Google Cloud. But uh, at UAB, we also have these uh, uh, software that we can execute. And these software will run through this data, build these uh, deep learning models, and uh, we can actually use these model to perform a variety of tasks. So that's really cool, but I'm oversimplifying all of these processes, of course. It turned out that you still have to pre-process the data. You have to learn how to tune the parameter so that the model will learn and avoid overfitting uh, quickly. Um, and then, um, so that that's that's really very promising. So, for one, for for an example, uh, if you have three D images of the heart or two three uh, D images of the human skull, and you can actually just treat these images as data in the matrix format. You can slice it, and then each slice would be considered as uh, a pixel representation of a data matrix. And you feed these data matrix into very, very deep layers of neural network uh, called a convolutionary neural network. Uh, that's the example. And then if you learn enough, you can say, well, what is skull, what is heart, right? So this is a biomedical application. Now, so far I've talked about general AI machine learning, but I haven't talked really about the large language models, which is really the underpinning mechanism of chat GPT. Now you may say, well, is large language model a deep learning model? The answer is yes, but it's a very specialized because it will take the language translation task uh, or any task related to human languages, understanding human language, generate human language, manipulate language, summarize report, um, do translations. And these are very, very generic tasks. Um, and then you can build this a large language model that can solve many, many tasks without building a specialized convolutionary deep learning neural network models. So how does, uh, what, how, what is this a large language modeling all about? Um, so I'll give you one example. It's a fill in the blank example. So the women went to this store and bought a what? Uh, uh, shoes. So you think about this, uh, it's almost like a game of uh, uh, Jeopardy or double je Jeopardy. So you have to fill in this blank and the computer will actually have to learn from many, many texts to say, well, maybe I would say a pair of shoes or a cart of shoes or a bag of shoes. What, what would you fill it out? Right? So if you ask this question, then ChatGPT can answer it perfectly. Uh, so that's, that's what the large language model is all about. But 
there are context-free models and context-based models, and they're fairly technical, but um, I won't go into too much details on how we implement it, but I'll just try to explain to you. So context-free model is essentially to say, for whatever word that you're trying to ask a computer to learn, the definition of the word does not change depending on the context. So for example, if you say bank account is the whatever the money, uh, the, the account that holds your money in the bank, bank of the river is the side of the, of the river. Um, it's actually not, has nothing to do with a bank account. So if you think about this bank, it does have two contacts, but in a dictionary, the way that they resolve it is to say uh, context one and then context two. But in contact free model, you completely eliminate the potential two different contexts. So that's not very good. Context based model is to learn uh, what exactly is the meaning of this word bank in the context of a sentence. You can do unidirectional, go from left to right and say, I access the bank. If you hide it, um, the future word, you probably still don't know what bank really mean until you go into, I access the bank account. Oh, you say, oh, okay, this bank is in the first context. But the bi-directional uh, models will look at a bank account first. Oh, you say, oh, okay, I already can resolve it uh, to this uh, implications and therefore there's no ambiguity, right? So with that, and I think uh, you have to attribute the Google's contribution to the large language model. They come up with a bi-directional encoder representation tr from transformers. It's very mouthful, but essentially this is one way of saying that it's a bi-directional context dependent uh, large language model that can be implemented using deep learning neural network, right? So this is called a BERT. And the BERT is really revolutionary in the sense that all of a sudden people are seeing the potential of having training computer-based language model and, and be, become better and better. So, so in the pre-BERT language modeling, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's going from left to right or right to to left, uh, it's really not very good at um, learning the context. But the bird is a language model that can can achieve a lot more. Let me see if I have a slide that shows an example. Okay, now here is another one example. So here is a sentence: the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Okay. So um, BERT uses an architecture called a transformers. And this transformer is not the movie transformer, but it's just a metaphor. Uh, the transformer can actually learn from itself and build the deep learning models that point from every words in the sentence and assign a significant contribution weight to the center word of interest. Okay, what do I mean is, okay, you go through each of the word, you say, which of the word may have a significant association to the word it? And you can learn and scan through, and in this particular case, it determined that animal is a significant contribution of the semantic of it and therefore it carried more weight. So the transformer is able to look at the sentence, mask each of the word and point out the significant contribution of each other words to it. And that's called a self-attention, right? Self-attention turned out to be revolutionary. And that's the main uh, concept behind the transformer architecture. And because of this, we're able to 
actually understand the more context. And I have another example, but somehow I didn't show here, where uh, there's another it, but that it refer to the street. Um, it's just say that the animal didn't cross the street because it was too dark. So just by changing tire to dark, you're not changing anything else and the attention mechanism is able to point the dark to it, uh, the street, oh yeah, the street was uh, too dark, okay. And then that was able to point not from the animal, uh, but then from the street to it. Okay, I'm not sure if I want to talk about the, this introduction to large language model from Google, but you can go to YouTube and learn this particular uh, concept in much more details, then I will skip this video for the interest of time. But large language models essentially are um, bird models, but scale up uh, 10 times, 100 times, or even a thousand times more. So in almost every field, every area that we're learning, um, actually interacting in our daily life today, there's a potential embedded large language model, right? So there, um, these models requires a lot of the model cu curation. The most popular one is a company called OpenAI. They're creating the so-called the foundational large language model and ChatGPT is the product and they're called foundational model. It's like they're building the engine of the industrial revolution. They're saying that these models, language models are so powerful, we can build it once, train it with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. And hopefully uh, a company that doing coding, copywriting, they can just fine tune such model and use the API of ChatGPT and then decided to deploy it in their own context. And so there are model creators, and of course, and there's a worldwide competitions, and we have these models, and now in China, they're also investing a large language models. And the key is to actually get hold of the hardware. So if you're a stock investor, you know that Nvidia is very powerful, uh, stock, mark, uh, stock have really even doubled since the beginning of this year. And it's because they are building hardware that is a foundation for open AI and many companies that want to build these large language models. And people like UAB and us, we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars just to train the foundation model. Um, then we actually take them and fine tune them on our architecture. And that's also okay. And so in that process, and I give you a sense of how these uh, large language model have evolved in size. But in 2018, the largest language model is ELMO, is 94 million, these so-called tokens, uh, or essentially that's the size of the model. The tokens roughly can be mapped to the number of neurons you have. And in the BERT large models, and one year later, we're reaching billions. Right. Another years later, um, and then uh, 10 billions, 11 billions. In uh, 2021 uh, and 2023, and we're reaching ChatGPT4. Uh, people are saying that uh, it has 700 billions of tokens. Right. So as we're going through the pandemic, the machines are evolving very, very rapidly uh, to the point that you see that it's already mastering all of these skills, like writing poems, uh, poems, doing translations. You may also have heard in the press that says, um, Google were training language models and they were training them based on available languages on the internet. Uh, and then there were some very obscure uh, African tribal language. And there were only a few words being trained, but then this uh, model can actually speak in that vernacular to African tribes. 
So that's the power of these uh, language models. In biology, and I look it up, NVIDIA are also getting into the field of biology. They pre-train some models. And the ESM1, for example, is a state-of-the-art model that can actually do protein function predictions. Uh, OpenFold will actually allow you to de novel generate foldings and de determine the protein structures. This is the one that in our lab we're actively looking at. It's called a Mo Mega Mo Bard. It's a model that has all of the uh, chemi chemicals from PubMed fed into the model. So if you are a chemist, you're trying to do drug discovery by feeding in into some chemical compounds that actually will uh, tell you what are the other similar compounds what are the potential chemical properties that really would be uh, convenient in revolutionize the future of drug discovery, right? So, and then these race is continuing. Uh, according to Nature in March, and we have many, many models, and now we're reaching trillion, uh, just a token size, and not only that, the large language model is just one specialization of what we call the artificial general intelligence, which not only use a language, but also use images, uh, perhaps uh, uh, other modalities. So what, what do we use uh, as a human to sense? We, we can hear, we can smell, we can see, we can feel the touches and the smooth texture of the object. So artificial general intelligence is to fuse all of these uh, sensors data from all of these different modalities. And then they're also building these uh, AI models for other modalities and they're becoming much, much more complex today. Uh, I'll skip this slide. Um, but then this slide also shows that our computing power also increased, right? This is a computing power based on CPUs. Uh, and then every year that this is in a log scale, so we're exponentially increasing our computing power uh, even after we reached the, the Mars lo law, which says that the computing power will double every 18 months and we're reaching the physics of uh, maybe electron-based uh, silicon wafer fabrication. Once you get into two nanometer features and then uh, you are gonna uh, hit a physics barrier. But after that, we can increase that in size and we can use a photon-based chips. We can use a quantum computer. So this trend is projected to continue. Right. With GPU, some people say that this is even faster uh, acceleration of computing power. So the consequence of this is that, uh, that we cannot help but thinking that perhaps uh, there is a uh, point of singularity, like in the physics uh, at the border of a, um, black holes, and when you have space and time that still existed once you reach the border of black holes and then there's no longer space and time everything get uh, sucked into the black hole by gravity and all the physics law doesn't uh, hold so singularity in the context of human and machine intelligence meaning that that the machine becomes smarter by, by human uh, than human so if you think about the neurons and the humans will roughly have about 600 billion neurons and uh, certainly we're ex superseding that uh, the size of the neurons in brains by the number of tokens. You can say the humans are still very power efficient when ChatGPT runs on uh, maybe billions times more power but then they're becoming more and more power efficient over time. And so it's very easy to extrapolate that we can reach AI singularity according to Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist 
from Microsoft uh, who retired. Um, he believed that uh, uh, we'll be reaching singularity next year or in 2025, right? So you can take it with a grain of salt, but this is what the data says. Essentially, the opportunity in medicine is that, uh, that in medicine, we think that uh, that we can also use these multimodality to do many, many applications. So the application can be precision medicine, and you can use machine learning models to do uh, digital clinical trials. Uh, you can also do pandem pandemic surveillance. Many, many applications that essentially use multimodality. Um, in biology is naturally multimodality because we can use imaging, we can use electronic medical records, which are language, uh, we can you also use genomics information that's a different modality and all of the other things that i talk about still holds right so in my lab we're very interested in using these multi-modality data we call it multi-omics uh, that could be genomic information that could be drugs that could be uh, phenotypes uh, and then we try to uh, predict out of all of these data, can we predict the human health at the individual level? Why does this person have a negative drug response when another person would be cured by this medicine? And so we use a lot of the internal representations that's called the knowledge graph. Um, and then we fuse these knowledge graph together into visualization. So, so I want to, uh, actually, I probably don't have time to talk about the details, but I, I want to uh, show you that in precision oncology, people have talking about using single modality, like a sequencing the tumor, finding where the mutation lies, and determine whether you can share the drug for different type of cancer since they share the mutation like EGFR is a primary mutation for brain tumor as well as a lung cancer. And maybe you can share the similar drug between brain tumor and lung cancer. Whereas in lung cancer, if the mutation is not in EGFR, maybe you try a different drug. However, when people have found out that this single modality does not really work. And uh, when you do sponsor trials, and when you try to pair drugs that way, it turned out that it only uh, prolonged patient life on average in 2016 by a matter of half a month to one month. There are many, many reasons, but the, one of the reasons is that it's, biology is very complex. There's tumor genetics, there's tumor type. Um, some are more aggressive than others. Um, and then the patient, may also have different genetic background that make them have better DNA repair than others. And whether you have prior treatment or not may also matter. And the tumor may have microenvironment. Some people are more stressed and therefore the immune system will work, have to work harder to combat the tumor. And that there are also the nutrition and diet may also have something to do. So obviously biology is very complex According to ASCO, uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology, you can actually factor all of these data and fuse these data into multimodality data sets. And that's essentially what we do in the Informatic Institute at UAB on a daily basis. We process these data, we uh, organize them, and then we start building mathematical model or deep learning model, large language model, so that we can actually use these models to guide us to say what kind of drugs are good for individuals and what are the prognosis and how can we develop better drugs uh, for future medicine, right? And then I will uh, skip a lot of this, but I want to emphasize that in our own lab, we realize that just a pure artificial intelligence is not gonna work in the medic uh, medical con uh, context. In the medical context, 
Um, even if you have a large language model that works 99.9%, .9%, you probably still do not trust this uh, compared to your doctor, whose uh, maybe uh, performance may be 80% or 85% correct. Why? Because there's a human factor to it. When you go to your doctor, you know that the doctor is bounded by the law and uh, he's got insurance coverage and that uh, he can really take into account uh, the nuances and the anecdote that you have come up with that the, the machine learning uh, uh, databases doesn't capture. And you may actually say, oh, I feel my heart palpitation the other day. And your doctor may incorporate that into the diagnosis when the machine does not record that information then may have lost that. And so there's all of these reasons that we want to make the AI to be explainable. And if the AI is understood by humans, uh, uh, the black box of neural networks is somehow mapped to translation, uh, transparent uh, decision trees. Uh, and then we can make an impact and we can actually uh, build explainable AI. And that's actually has been the focus of my lab. Um, how we build these uh, explainable AIs, essentially we build these uh, little maps, right? These are heat maps with a knowledge graph underneath it. And these knowledge graph can be interpreted by humans, right? This is gene and the gene network. And the, these genes are, uh, just uh, interacting together, that's something that the biologist can validate in wet lab. Or you can say drug-drug interaction, whether these two drugs are interacting, you can go to PubMed literature to find out what are the literature report to it. So we can build these uh, knowledge graph together with this visualization, and we use these visualization and a lot of it loaded with a lot of parameters, we can do many, many predictions. For example, we can turn the big data, functional genomic data, uh, essentially the measurement of genes activities in brain tumor of four different subtypes into these uh, gene theory models, right? So you can see that there's four different subtypes. They all look different. And if human can interpret these patterns and so can the neural network, the neural network is able to uh, do classifications and uh, say, well, uh, given a new data set, what exactly is the subtype of your disease uh, by matching to any one of these models? And what is the difference between purely using large language model or uh, AI versus using a gene terrain, a flavor of explainable XAI? So the gene terrain flavor of explainable AI is able, uh, we are not only able to see the features, we can also zoom into the detail to see what are the underlying genes, what are the underlying gene signatures and all of the underlying gene expression values so that when we are making decision, we know how it works. This how it works will turn out to be very, very difficult, right? So I will skip all of these details, um, but then uh, I think uh, 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 I, will, I will directly jump into the, uh, since I only have three minutes left, I'll directly jump into some of the general claim. So at UAB, we just got approved by the Board of Trustees of University of Alabama to form a new center called the Systems Pharmacology AI Research Center. And I'll be uh, fortunate to be the inaugural director. Uh, in this center, we're trying to fuse the knowledge networks related to drug discovery that we call Systems Pharmacology. All of these knowledges that we can collect millions of these data from cancer, uh, National Cancer Institute data portal. We want to transform them into uh, AI-ready 
images and data sets. And then we want to come up with many different permutations of context with words and describe uh, for particular models, what are the drug discovery uh, context? Maybe you apply a drug and you come up with a pattern. When you have a genetic mutation along with the drug, you have another uh, pattern. We can build many, many of these images. And then we, we want to build specialized large language model. And uh, of course, ChatGPT included so that we can do uh, new inspiration, new generation of uh, drug discovery. So it is conceivable by me that maybe in 10 years later, the drug discovery will not be costly and the time consuming that takes 10 years, $2 billion uh, to come up with. My dream is that maybe in 10 years, 20 years, we should be able to spend personalized, uh, maybe $2,000 and develop a perfect drug for your uh, condition by asking all the information and then maybe have the drug delivered to you within the months. Wouldn't that be cool? Well, I think that, that requires a lot and lots of research that um, involve NIH funding um, and, uh, and I, I, want, I want to stop here because I'm running out of time. I, I actually have some interesting slides about the future of AI, but that may be moving to another talk in the future. And some of the example that I showed here were the work of these collaborators at UAB School of Medicine, my own lab, and I think all of these funding agencies. Uh, we're also thinking about potentially setting up a startup company. If you have some ideas and how to connect us with philanthropy funding or even participate in startup, feel free to reach me. And we're very happy uh, to engage all of our alumni for this very great cause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chin. Do you have a couple of minutes for Q&A? Sure, yeah. Awesome. Um, so through the chat, um, and this person does say, sorry if it's too broad, but what are a few of your recommendations if someone wants to learn about the linear kernels models that create linear separation? Yeah, I think if you take any of the university level courses like uh, machine learning at UAB, I know that there are several schools, every school offer traditional machine learning course in the business school in computer science department in engineering uh, they will all teach you these uh, basics, linear kernel based method. That's uh, the example I showed is called SVM. And that's, that's more traditional. But what I'm teaching you today, I don't think uh, they, they have made their ways into the university courses yet. What is the best platform to start learning how to use AI? Yeah. I think uh, you should uh, uh, just search on Google uh, prompt engineering, right? So first of all, you should get a chat GPT and pay for $20. I am not affiliate with them, but $24 pay for GPT-4, right? And then you can ask all this question to me, to Ch GPT-4, and most of the time, unless it evolved very specialized bioinformatics subject. And most of the time it's very good. And in many areas it is even better than me uh, with the caveat that sometimes uh, it doesn't, it, it hallucinate and it's trying to be creative at a cost of maybe losing uh, the factual basis. So, so use ChatGPT and search up prompt engineering. Can AI-assisted mammograms be more effective than doctor-only scan evaluations? Yes. In fact, uh, for these very specialized, uh, specialized uh, tasks, AI can already do better. But the problem, as I said, is sometimes uh, the data that you feed into these machine learning uh, models are uncertified. 
So I think at UAB, I'm trying to actually set up uh, AI board to review all of the claim that they're using AI because some people can actually just label their application as AI. They only train it with very biased data and, uh, and try to sell it. And that's not good. You want to actually uh, have a board review how you're training the model. What are the representation? What is the uh, demographic? to make sure I can certify you to the platinum level, and then you can, of course, use it. And that will be better than the doctors. And it's just amazing, this whole, all this technology is just gonna be moving at a rapid pace as we go forward. Dr. Chen, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and being with us today. Thank you, all right. You're so welcome. And a quick reminder, a replay of today's webinar will be uploaded onto our website by tomorrow. And as an attendee, you will get an email with that link once it's ready. Before we go, we have a few other webinars to pass along to you next Tuesday, September 19th. We'll welcome Nick Chincio for Strategizing for Sustainability as we learn what UAB is doing and how you can play your part in the world around us. On Tuesday, September 26th, come back for Can We Starve Ourselves to Better Health and Longer Life? Dr. Stephen Osted will join us as we discover what we've learned about the impact of food restriction. Then on Tuesday, October 17th, Dr. Megan Hayes will be here for Head Over Meals, Weight Management Strategies from Behavioral Medicine. Attendees will leave with an understanding of factors that influence weight gain. And on Thursday, October 19th, we will welcome Dr. Lawrence Boite for Crafting Your Job and Life. In this webinar, we'll, we'll discover ways to improve well-being and engagement in the workplace. And finally, we'd love to get your feedback on what you thought about today's webinar. The QR code on your screen takes you to a very short survey. Share your thoughts so we know what you'd like to see and how we can continuously provide good content. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And as always, go Blazers.